Hey, well, thank you, Dino, and thanks to you for showing up tonight at 6 o'clock Eastern time on a gorgeous day, at least in the tri-state area. Uh, I spoke on cruise ships prior to COVID-19, and every fall uh, I would do the uh, Boston, Bar Harbor, Maine, Portland, Maine, uh, Halifax, uh, Cape Britain, Quebec run. Uh, sometimes we even get into uh, Prince Edward Island. So every year for about eight, nine years, I was on the ship, we'd leave uh, Cape, what is called Cape Liberty now, uh, in New Jersey, uh, Bayonne. And uh, the first talk I had to give, it took, uh, believe it or not, you could have walked there faster. It took two days to get from Boston, New York to Boston. Like I said, you could have walked faster. Uh, but they slowed it down to like seven miles an hour until we whipped around Cape Cod. But I had to give a talk on Boston, Bar Harbor, and Portland every year. And uh, I took a, a good chunk of this talk from that and also how Boston and Nova Scotia and uh, Quebec play the big role in the formation of this country. And that is Boston. That's the seaport uh, in Boston, and back there is Atlantic Street and all the other uh, spots that uh, where history took place. Now, Boston is also where the pilgrims uh, were, and uh, there is uh, the Boston Common, and in the middle of the Boston Common, there is uh, uh, the pilgrims uh, landing nearby at Plymouth Rock, and there is Plymouth Rock. Not really much, all that much to see. They took a rock and stamped 1620 on it. Plymouth Rock is about a half hour outside of Boston. I decided one day, let's take a drive there. Let's see what Plymouth Rock really looks like. And I said, that? But 1620, the Mayflower. Plymouth Rock is the traditional site of the disembarkation of William Bradford and the Mayflower Pilgrims who founded Plymouth Colony in 1920. Uh, yet, uh, the Pilgrims never talked about uh, Plymouth Rock in any of their writings. Uh, the first known uh, reference to this rock dates back to 1715, 95 years later, when it was described in the town boundary records as a great rock. I don't know. Take a look at that rock. Is that a great rock or not? Meanwhile, Boston was founded in 1630 by colonists led by John Winthrop and gets its name from an English village. Um, one of the major, I'm a journalist, my background is writing op-ed pieces for newspapers, and I, uh, I broke into newspapers when I was 15 years old in uh, 1971 with the Rockland County Journal News and the Bergen Record in northern New Jersey. And one of the things that always interests me is that where did newspapers start in the United States? And it started with this thing uh, called the Boston Newsletter. Uh, it was uh, on April 24th, 1704, that it published for the first time. And the first edition was a half sheet, two pages, and it contained news taken from the London papers and a small amount of domestic news. And that would make sense with the London papers because all the residents of Boston were, of course, English. Um, there was no America. There was no United States of America. This was a bunch of colonies, 13 to the south, and you had uh, Nova Scotia and Quebec and Upper Canada and Lower Canada. That was the English New World. Uh, the paper would change its name several times. The last owners were Margaret Draper. That's unusual for a woman to be an owner and John Howe, and they were Tories. They were feast, uh, fierce Tories, and the paper was discontinued in 1776 after the British evacuated Boston. That's the State House. Um, I like the State House entrance, General Hooker entrance. Um, uh, I won't make any real jokes about that, except El uh, um, Elton Spitzer. Elton Spitzer used to be uh, one of uh, my bosses at WGRC way back when, but Elliot Spitzer, that might have been better for him um, if he was in Boston than in Albany. But anyway, that's the General Hooker entrance. The Boston Massacre. Well, that's a deadly riot that occurred on March 5th, 1770 on King Street in Boston. It began as a street brawl between American colonists or North American colonists 
and a lone British soldier, but quickly escalated to a chaotic, bloody slaughter. The conflict energized anti-British sentiment and paved the way for the American Revolution. And that's John Adams, who uh, was a lawyer and took an unpopular position of defending the British. Um, certain that impartial jurors in Boston were not going to be found, uh, Adams convinced the judge to see the jury of non-Bostonians. Of course, there was no local news at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock, which would have shown you all of the uh, video of what happened. So the British soldiers did receive a fair trial because most people had no idea what was going on. The Boston Massacre would be another step to the eventual war between Britain and the colonists. The events that led to the American Revolution included arguments over the tax on tea that led to the Boston Tea Party. During the uh, protest, three British ships were raided by colonists dressed as Indians who dumped the tea into the harbor. Listen, my children, and you shall hear the midnight ride of that guy, Paul Revere. And oh, by the way, if you ever in Boston, that is the Boston Tea Party shops and museum for 10 bucks you could go in there they will give you some tea and you could dump the tea into the water it's a bargain 10 bucks for a tea bag you can't go wrong uh but anyway and you shall hear the midnight ride of paul revere 1775 paul revere spread the word that the british were coming the next day the shot heard round the world was fired singling the start of the american revolution uh of course that was Longfellow who wrote it, and that was a long time afterwards, so he might have thrown some things in there. But as a school kid, I had to uh, learn, listen, you know, uh, all my, you know, listen, and you shall hear the midnight ride of Paul Revere. One if by land, two if by sea, Paul Revere's midnight ride on April 18th, 1775, which preceded the battles of Lexington and Concord during the American Revolution. And there is Wads, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow who uh, wrote the poem. Uh, it's not quite the tale. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere on the 18th of April in 75. Hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous date or a year. It's probably pretty good because it didn't happen that way. Uh, the poem uh, exaggerated Revere's role by ignoring other writers. Uh, and Longfellow's poem inaccurately claimed that uh, Revere made it all the way to Concord. In fact, British soldiers captured him, took away his horse. Uh, and that is the Boston Common. Uh, and the Boston Common, of course, is a big part, it's kind of like Central Park, right? And uh, Stanley Park in Vancouver. Boston Common is a central public park downtown Boston, sometimes erroneously referred to as the Boston Commons. Dating from 1634, it's the oldest park in the United States, and it's been a place for many uses. Uh, the colonial uh, militia mustered for the revolution there. In 1768, the British Redcoats began an eight-year encampment. George Washington, John Adams, and General Lafayette uh, went to celebrate the nation's independence in that park. And uh, 1860, there were many Civil War recruitment and anti-slavery meetings there. During World War I, Victory Gardens sprouted there. During World War II, the common gave most of its iron fencing away for scrap metal. And there is the Boston Common and the Prudential Center back there. Um, and uh, speaking of insurance, John Hancock was the richest man in um, in North America uh, back uh, in 1768. And he got very upset because uh, he was uh, taxed. He, he was also into shipping and the ships were taxed. And he becomes more and more, let's put it, uh, outraged, outraged because he had to pay tax. Now, uh, back in those days with Hancock, most people didn't care about the American Revolution. Uh, it was the rich people cared about the, the revolution, the 3% of the country. Guys like Hancock and George Washington 
and uh, Ben Franklin, they cared about taxes in terms of um, the common person. Well, first of all, slaves were three-fifths men or women, three-fifths human. And most people really didn't pay attention to what was going on uh, between this fight of the upper class of, uh, of the Americas and uh, back home in London. Uh, the Boston Common continues to be a stage for free speech and public assembly. During the 1920s, or rather the, yeah, the 20s and 30s and 40s, Charles Lindbergh promoted commercial aviation there. Anti-Vietnam War and civil rights rallies were held there, including one held by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In 1979, Pope John Paul II celebrated Mass in the Commons. Oh, also in the Commons, um, baseball season about ready to start. Of course, the Mets lost Edwin Diaz for anybody who, who cares about uh, losing your best relief pitcher in a meaningless World Baseball uh, Classic Tournament. But anyway, 1948 World Series, TV had just come to Boston and not everybody had a TV. So the Boston Braves playing the Cleveland Indians, 1948 World Series, not many people had TVs. So they set up TVs in the middle of the Boston Common and a couple hundred people gathered around the TV to watch the Boston Braves play the Cleveland Indians. Uh, and that was game one of the 1948 World Series, October 6, 1948. And the State House is next to the Common. That building uh, was designed by the architect Charles Bullfinch, completed in 1798, and has repeatedly been enlarged. It's considered a masterpiece of federal architecture and among Bullfinch's finest works and designated a National Historic Landmark for its uh, architectural significance. Okay, let's talk about the Treaty of Paris and Boston and Nova Scotia and Quebec and the French and Indian War, which might have been started by George Washington as early as 1754. The um, Treaty of Paris ends the French and Indian War between Great Britain and France. Great Britain is not engaged in war with any country for the first time in 50 years. Parliament turns its attention to regulating the empire, especially in the northern, in the colonies in North America. Well, the Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763. In that conflict with France, Britain incurred an enormous debt and looked to the American colonies, and now the Canadian colonies, but looked to all the colonies, about 16 or 17 of them, to pay for the war. This is what uh, the 13 colonies look like. Um, take a look at where Maine is. That was Massachusetts. And above Massachusetts was Nova Scotia uh, in those days. And um, so there you got um, Massachusetts controlling two plots of land uh, separated by New Hampshire. There you have New York. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Those are the 13 Southern colonies. In the South, they're watching what happened in the North. The South, the Massachusetts colony, just South of Nova Scotia. And they know that England in 1759 uh, wiped out uh, the French in Quebec City uh in Montcalm uh the Marquis de Montcalm the French general was killed in the battle um which lasted 15 minutes and the English basically took over Quebec uh and they also know that there was the uh chasing of the French from Nova Scotia and uh uh that uh, is Evangeline uh if you ever want to uh read another one of Longfellow's works uh basically it was ethnic cleansing that's what happened there. So the French end up all over the world if they survived getting out of Halifax. Um, and that's why we have Cajun culture in the South, because the French had that territory and some of the people from uh, uh, Halifax and Nova Scotia, the Acadians, ended up in uh, Louisiana, came the Cajun, American Cajun culture. So they're wondering what's next, because they're hearing from their cousins and neighbors just across the river in Nova Scotia. The colonists want to be like Barbados. Uh, and there is Boston. Uh, 
wait a minute, Barbados? Well, Barbados was uh, intimately involved in the English Civil War, which resulted in the defeat and execution of Charles I in 1649 and the rise to power of Oliver Cromwell as Lord Protector. The war would come to Barbados in 1651 and end with the Charter of Barbados, and there is Barbados. The Royalists who supported King Charles went to Barbados rather than losing their heads like the King and bought property in Barbados. Uh, the uh, Charter of Barbados agreed upon January 11th, 1652, uh, ratified at the Mermaid Tavern in Osteen's on January 17th, and there were 23 articles. Uh, in that, uh, in, including addressing religious liberty, Article 1, fr uh, free trade, and uh, this one, taxation and the authority of the local assembly. The Civil War, Charlie or Barbados, done on, on January 17, 1652. Now, think of this one. No taxes, customs, imports, loans, or excise shall be laid nor levied made on any of the inhabitants of the island without their gen consent in the General Assembly. That's Article 3 of the Charter of Barbados. Uh, and uh, if you go to Barbados, there are plaques up there. And uh, I'm going to just read the end of, of the plaque. This talks all about uh, the Civil War, how it came to uh, Barbados, and there was a naval battle in Ostens Bay and all. But... Um, it guaranteed Barbadian colonists their rights to land, local control of taxation, liberty of conscience, and access to the courts of law and limited free trade. Um, so the Boston Tea Party, did it start or did the idea germinate at the Mermaid Tavern in Osteen's, which basically resulted in this charter of Barbados now? Uh, and the treaty said the Barbadians uh, would accept the authority of the English Parliament uh, and also um, they, they couldn't raise local taxes without local consent. And if you're ever in Barbados, near the uh, cruise ship port, there are placards. And one of the placards says, the Treaty of Ostens that was negotiated and signed at the Mermaid Tavern uh, in 1652 and its concept of no taxation without representation was the inspiration for the Boston Tea Party in 1773 and uh, subsequently included in the American Declaration of Independence. They got the year wrong, 1776. So the British Parliament in 1763 issues the Proclamation of 1763 prohibiting the settlement of the American colonies west of the Appalachian Mountains. And this proclamation is greatly resented in Virginia. Uh, people like George Washington and Patrick Henry are getting upset. Uh, Parliament imposes a Stamp Act for taxing the American colonies in 1765. Patrick Henry introduces the Stamp Act resolves in the Virginia House of Burgesses. These resolves challenge Great Britain's right to impose the tax. 1766, Parliament repeals the Stamp Act, but passes the Declaratory Act, which asserts Great Britain's right to pass any laws governing the American colonies. 1767, Parliament imposes the Townshead duties, taxing imports of tea, glass, paper, lead, and paint in the American colonies. Look at that signature. That signature was big, wasn't it? John Hancock came into direct conflict with the British in 1768 when one of his merchant ships, the Liberty, was seized in Boston Harbor by British custom officials who claimed that Hancock had illegally unloaded cargo without paying the required taxes. And people in the, in the colonies knew all about uh, Barbados, whether it was George Washington being there for uh, about six weeks, uh, being introduced to uh, the Charter of Barbados, or Barbadians who came up and lived in the Carolinas or Virginia, who might have talked to uh, Jefferson. Nobody knows for sure how Jefferson found out about the Treaty of Barbados, but he certainly did. Hancock was a popular figure in Boston, and the seizure of his ship led to angry prote protests by local residents. In the ensuing months and years, Hancock became increasingly involved in the movement for American independence. Massachusetts was at the center of the movement, and Boston, in particular, was dubbed the Cradle of Liberty. Uh, while Hancock 
is uh, complaining, George Washington goes to look for allies. This is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm a reporter, and uh, I got exclusive access to George and one of one of his old acquaintances from the uh, French and Indian War. And George is saying, "Hey, listen, you know, uh, we gotta get rid of these English guys. You know, we just gotta get rid. They'll be good for you. They'll be good for you. Uh, just you know, please uh, listen to what I say and and think about it. Uh, we might need your help in a couple of years. I'm going up and down the Mahangahelia and the Allegheny and the Ohio and the Potomac. I need your help. What do you say?" We'll get rid of those Brits forever. Oh, aren't you a Brit? Eh, it doesn't matter. Let's get rid of them. George Washington may have known the English pulled uh, their best troops out of North America in 1767. He opposed the Stamp Act and the Townsend Act, as well as the 1774 Intolerable Act. By the late 1760s, Washington had experienced firsthand the effects of rising taxes imposed on the American colonists by the British and came to believe that it was in the best interest of the colonists to declare independence from England. 1773, Parliament passes the Tea Act. The Boston Tea Party takes place, obviously, in Boston, Massachusetts. A party of nearly 50 men described as, uh, disguised as Indians, led by Samuel Adams, board ships, breaks open 342 chests of tea, and dumps them into the Boston Harbor. And again, uh, for 10 bucks, you could go relive the experience of Samuel Adams. Seeking to boost the troubled East India Company, the British Parliament adjusted import duties. While the consignees in Charleston and New York and Philadelphia rejected tea shipments, the merchants in Boston refused to concede to Patriot uh, pressure. And uh, last time I was in Boston was in 2019, prior to COVID and um, preserving the Old South Meeting House, where the Boston Tea Party began. On the night of December 16, 1773, Samuel Adams led, but did not go onto the ships to protest. 60 members of the Sons of Liberty boarded the three ships. Uh, in the harbor, they threw 342 chests of tea overboard, and this resulted in the passage of the punitive coercive acts. Uh, the coercive acts were intended to punish the colony in general and Boston in particular, both for the Tea Party and the pattern of resistance it exemplified. Um, one thing, the elites, Ben Franklin was an elite. He had a lot of money. George Washington was an elite. Now, Washington, on one hand, in written documents said, yeah, go Boston, go. On the other hand, he thought Bostonians were mad. They went after private property. Ben Franklin offered to pay, pay Bostonian the, uh, the, the, the money after the Bostonians threw the uh, tea into the uh, harbor. Uh, Boston, went for, all, uh, for all purposes, was put under martial law after that. Um, so uh, the Boston Harbor was closed until the tea lost and the Boston Tea Party was paid for. Uh, the British ended the Massachusetts Constitution, ended free election of town officials, moved judicial authority to Britain and British judges, basically creating martial law in Massachusetts, required colonists, colonists to quarter British troops on demand. Hey, you know what? You put these people up. We don't want to. Well, you will or else. And extended the freedom of worship to French Canadian Catholics under British rule, particularly in western Massachusetts, which angered the mostly Protestant colonists. Uh, the Brits did that in the Northern Territories uh, in Quebec um, after they sacked the uh, Quebecois uh, or the French in 1759. Couldn't practice your religion, couldn't talk French. But the British knew a war was coming uh, in Quebec. And in Quebec, they wanted the, the Quebecois on their side. So they said, okay, you can practice your religion. You can practice your, your speech. Well, they were hoping to, or they were trying to make sure that the Quebecois were on their side in case a war broke out. Well, they didn't have to do that because the Quebecois regarded those people, the Southern colonists as godless hedonists, and they wanted no part of the people in the South. Actually, uh, Benedict Arnold during uh, the French Revolution, uh, during the American Revolution, 
<laughs> invaded Quebec City in, in winter and didn't realize how cold it was in the winter. And that led to Benedict Arnold eventually surrendering. So did Washington like the Tea Party? No. In June 1774, Washington wrote, the cause of Boston will be considered as the cause of America. But his personal views of the event were far different. He voiced strong disapproval of their conduct in destroying the tea and claimed Bostonians were mad. Washington, like other elites, held uh, private property off limits. And Franklin, formerly of Boston, uh, he went to Philadelphia, but most of the family stayed in Boston, insisted the British East India Company be reimbursed for the lost tea and even offered to pay for it himself. Well, meanwhile, up in the Berkshires, and I get to go to the Berkshires in about two and a half months, uh, because summer is coming, right? Uh, near Great Barrington is about 120 miles from Boston. And uh, well, let's let me read what's on on that rock there in front of the courthouse. Near this spot stood the first courthouse of Berkshire County, erected 1764. Here, August 16th, 1774, occurred the first open resistance to British rule in America. Now, yeah, I realized the news traveled rather slowly back in the day. You know, you had to get across Massachusetts. Generally, you did that by horse from Boston to Great Barrington. But it didn't take that long for the news to go that far because I thought the Boston Tea Party uh, was the first open resistance to British rule in America. News traveled slowly when you were in the Berkshires. Skirmishes between British troops and colonial militiamen in Lexington and Concord in April 1775 kicked off the armed conflict that we know as the American Revolution. The Second Continental Congress, who's who of uh, the forefathers, uh, takes place in Philadelphia. Oh, the guy who's running the Continental Congress was John Hancock. But the Second Continental Congress, remember, there's no country here, it's just the Congress, uh, meets in Philadelphia. Peyton, uh, Peyton Randolph is reelected the president of Congress. George Washington is named commander in chief of the American forces. Hancock might have wanted that job. In fact, Hancock was kind of itching to get that job, but he didn't get it. King George III declares the American colonies in rebellion. Oh, Washington was all prepared for war. Remember, he was back in 1770 looking for allies. He was so prepared that he showed up at the Second Continental Congress in a military uniform, signaling he was prepared for war. He had the prestige, the military experience, and more importantly, he had charisma. And there is Washington. He hated, from what I read, uh, the portraits of him. Take a look at him. He's a huge body and small head. Huge body and small head. Well, that's the father of the country. Uh, Washington was back in Barbados in 1751. He had to go there because his half-brother Lawrence had tuberculosis, and George drew the short straw and went down with his brother, who was told by his doctors to go to Barbados in the winter because the heat would cure the tuberculosis. Uh, which never happened, but uh, he died uh, eventually, 1752. But Washington, George Washington, was literally given the keys to the island uh, because of uh, Lawrence Washington's wife's uncle, Gedney Clark, who was a slave trader and a businessman who knew everybody in town. And he took George around, and George had keen insight into the British strengths and weaknesses, which would prove invaluable during the revolution. Washington had an ability to keep his struggling colonial army together. His troops poorly trained, lacked food, ammunition, other supplies, maybe not getting shoes in the winter, but he kept them going. He motivated them to keep going. Philadelphia, the Liberty Bell. And there it is, the declaration of a uh, declaration by the representatives of the United States of America to the General Congress. Um, that was done, and the president was John Hancock. That was done before July 4th because uh, these guys had to get out of Philadelphia in a hurry. Declaration of Independence as president of the Continental Congress. Boston's John Hancock is credited as the first signee or signer of the Declaration of Independence. His prominent, stylish signature became famous, according to legend. And if you ever take one of those walking tours in Boston, they would tell you the same thing. 
Hancock boldly inscribed his name so the English king, George III, would not need his glasses to read it. Today, the term John Hancock is synonymous with signature. Oh, George III, poor George III, America is lost. Must we fall beneath the blow or have I? Well, anyway, George III is so upset. He's thinking of, of abandoning and abdicate, abdicating as the king of England. Then he remembers what Mel Brooks once said. It's good to be the king. Uh, in 1781, the Americans, with the assistance of France, beat England in Yorktown, Virginia. Uh, king George III was reluctant to uh, come to terms with his army's defeat in the Battle of Yorktown. He drafted an abdication speech, but in the end said, hey, you take care of it, you're politicians, I'm the king. Hey, wait, I am the king, aren't I? Uh, 1793, Treaty of Paris recognized the United States and ceded Florida to Spain. Hey, the Harvard Library had a book, my, one of my books uh, in the Harvard Library. I don't know if it's still there because I did it in 2005. It's a paperback, but uh, Harvard Library, if you ever stop there, ask about my book if it's still there. Uh, Boston's an area of colleges, Brandeis, Harvard, Boston University, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, all located along the Charles River. And, there is my daughter who applied to Harvard many years ago, ended up at NYU, the Harvard bookstore. And there is Cambridge. Um, this was a long time ago when my kids were small. Banned in Boston. Banned in Boston. Hmm. Uh, the Watch and Ward Society's crusade against books, burlesque, and the social evil. Do you think book banning is new in the United States? It ain't been going around for a long time. Uh, banned in Boston was a phrase employed from the late 19th century through the mid 20th century to describe a literary work, song, motion picture, or play that had been prohibited from distribution or exhibition in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston officials had wide authority to ban works featuring objectionable content and often banned works with sexual content or foul language. That is the Watch and Ward Society, the New England Watch and Ward Society, Boston. It started in 1879. The Watch and Ward Society, or the New England Society for the Suppression of Vice, devoted itself to shutting down gambling operations, burlesque calls, and brothels. They were most famous, however, for their censorship of books, magazines, and plays, giving birth to the phrase banned in Boston. Hemingway was banned in Boston, as was Faulkner and Huxley and Sinclair Lewis, who once said that uh, if uh, fashion, fas fashion, if uh, fascism comes to the United States, it will be wrapped in a cross, which is probably why he got banned in Boston. Uh, Eugene O'Neill, Upton Sinclair, Voltaire, Walt Whitman, H.G. Wells, H.G. Wells, H.G. Wells was, you know, moon, moon, uh, and Mars rather. First man on the moon and, and the Martians, right? Invading the United States. Banned in Boston. Not only, not only uh, were uh, books banned in Boston, but uh, so is rock and roll. May 3rd, 1958 show at the Boston Arena was a major problem for Alan Freed as he was charged, the disc jockey, uh, with inciting a riot. 1958, he emceed and managed the 17 act Big Beat show featured Jerry Lee Lewis and Frankie Lyman. Frankie Lyman, who had a song, I'm not going to be a juvenile, I'm not a juvenile delinquent. Chuck Berry and Danny and the Juniors. Kids packed into the aisles, singing along and dancing, but things started to get a little out of hand. A few bottles were broken, the scuffle broke out, police stopped the show. 15 people were beaten and robbed in the streets after the show. None of the perpetrators ever caught. The only arrest made following the melee was Alan Freed who was charged with inciting a riot. That would not be the first time that Alan Freed uh, faced charges. The, he faced charges, similar charges, but they were dropped in 1952 for a concert in Cleveland. Case never went to trial. And there is the mayor, John Hines. May 5th, John Hines banned rock and roll shows in the city of Boston. Those so-called rock and roll music programs are a disgrace and must be stopped. As far as I'm concerned, Boston's seen the last of them. Freedom Trail is an interesting uh, walk if you ever go to Boston. It's 2.5 miles long. 
uh, passes 16 locations significant uh, in the history of the United States. It's, well, you could see it. There's brick, it winds between the Boston Common to the USS Constitution in Charleston. Stops along the trail include ground markers, graveyards, notable churches and buildings, and a historic naval frigate, USS Constitution. That was me 41 years ago now. Wow, 41 years ago I was there. Freedom Trail was originally conceived by a local journalist by the name of William Schofield, who in 1951 suggested building a pedestrian trail to link together the important local landmarks. By 1953, 40,000 people were walking the trail annually. Uh, and that is the Freedom uh, Trail as it goes through uh, the North End, the Italian section of town. It's a 1963 Chevrolet. Not bad, not bad. Freedom Trail comes from the Haymarket and Blackstone Street through the Greenway Parks to Cross Street. The path then heads down Hanover Street, takes a short detour through the North Square to pass the Paul Revere House before returning to Hanover Street. At the St. Stephen's Church, the path turns into the Prado. Paul Revere Mall Park past uh, Cyrus E. Dallin's famous equestrian statue of Paul Revere to the north of the, or to the North Church on Salem Street. From the Old North Church, uh, the trail heads uh, up Hull Street to Copps Hill Burial Ground before heading out of the North End towards Charleston. That's Faneuil Hall. Last time I was there, it was undergoing some construction. Um, it's a marketplace in the meeting hall near the waterfront in today's government seat. It was opened in 1743. It was the site of several speeches by Samuel Adams. Uh, on one of those tours near Faneuil Hall, like you know, where the cemetery is, not very far from there where the Franklins are buried, uh, the tour guide talked about Samuel Adams and how Samuel Adams often spoke to the clouds in the sky and maybe had one or two people that listened to him. At least that's how he started. James Otis and others uh, encouraging independence from Great Britain. It's a well-known stop on the Freedom Trail as is the Quincy Market. Uh, it's a historic market complex near Faneuil Hall, constructed 1824 to 26, uh, named in honor of Mayor Josiah Quincy, who organized its construction without tax or debt. Tax or debt, man, these sports owners should have talked to him because they wouldn't have gotten, they would have gotten their stadiums, but well, whatever. The market is designated as a National Historic Landmark and designated a Boston Landmark in 1996. Hey, the first subway in the United States was not New York. It was in Boston and it's still used to this day over on Park Street in Boston. The Tremont Street subway in Boston's MBTA subway system is the oldest subway tunnel in North America. It opened September 1st, 1897. And that is the North End. Uh, I go to uh, Mama Anna to eat up there all the time. It's a good Italian restaurant right on Atlantic Street. They'll appreciate the plug. Uh, the North End has historic sites and stories from the days of the American Revolution through the China trade period of the 1800s, early 1800s, to the Irish, Portuguese, Jewish, and Italian immigrants who flooded uh, Boston over the last century and a half. And um, there was one of the pastry shops in the North End. Each left an indelible impact on commerce, customs, religious tra uh, traditions, politics among the city. That's the Boston Pops, um, Arthur Friedler. I don't know if you know of the body uh, comedian, Rusty Warren, uh, from the 50s and 60s, who came from Boston. Um, she was banned from radio and TV. She did uh, knockers up, among other things. But she went to the New England Conservatory of Music, and her instructor was Arthur Fiedler, who ran the Boston Pops. Uh, on the Charles River Esplanade stands the Hatch Cell, Shell where concerts are given in summer evenings and nearly 50 year tenure as the Boston Pops conductor, 1930 to 79, Arthur Fiedler established the Boston Pops as a national icon. There is Arthur Fiedler. He moved the Pops beyond its origins in light classical music into the world of pop culture, showcasing the popular artists of the day, as well as the work of young American composers and arrangers. 
and there is Arthur Fiedler. Fiedler organized the first free outdoor orchestral concerts on the Charles River Esplanade that led to Boston's now famous 4th of July concert, established the Pops as the most recorded orchestra in history, including the bestseller Jazz, uh, Jazz Louise, and uh, introduced uh, the uh, evening at the Pops television series. Uh, oh, when the Boston Pops needs a vacation, they end up in Tanglewood. Um, and John Williams, I was, that's a John Williams concert, and I was there that night. Uh, John Williams was conducting the Boston Pops, and they were doing uh, Star Wars, right? And that's what they were doing. And, of course, it's 120 miles west of Boston, and uh, that's, they also, there's some ringers in there from New York City that go up there. Oh, Julia Child, she's a Bostonian. Well, anyway, the Eastern Educational Television Network, or EEN, Incorporated after a 1959 demonstration of a hookup between Boston and Durham, New Hampshire. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, the original intent of uh, you know, the National Education Tele or um, NET was just to swap programs out. Um, this was a little different. Uh, founded by WGBH President Hartford Gunn to boost the supply of programs available to stations in the Northeast, it was the first regional public TV network. Julia Child's The French Chef becomes one of EEN's most successful programs. EEN later grows into a national distributor now known as American Public Television. There is Cheers. It's a long time ago. I had hair. 1982. There is Cheers down there. It's at 84 Beacon Street, Boston, Massachusetts, 02108. The location was originally called the Bull and Bench of Bull and Finch Club, but it was renamed Cheers after the show was off the air for several years, but endured in popularity. Like the bar on the show, it's located in Beacon Hill. The Bull and Finch Pub was founded in 1969. It was popular, a local neighborhood pub, until the producers of Cheers discovered it while looking for the quintessential American bar. Okay, my friend Shelley Saltman. He uh, was the promoter of the Bobby Riggs, Billy Jean King, Babble of the Sexes, um, Network TV extravaganza in 1973. He was also beaten up by Evil Knievel, and wherever he is now, he passed away four years ago. I know his ears are burning, and I know he's got his burner phone, and he says, I got to call Evan, I got to call. He used to do that all the time. But he told me. Uh, who was in the neighborhood in Boston where he grew up. And uh, this guy, Leonard Nimoy, was there. His father, Max, was the neighborhood barber. Every kid uh, in the little Jewish quarter in Boston had his uh, hair cut by Leonard Nimoy. Oh, John F. Kennedy. Oh, by the way, the other uh, people, um, Lenny was uh, Shelley's friend. The other people who grew up in that neighborhood, another one of Shelley's friends, Barry Morse. Uh, another one of Shelley's acquaintances, she would not be Shelley's friend, uh, Baba Wawa. Oh, I say that because uh, it's Barbara Walters, but uh, she didn't pronounce her R's in high school, according to uh, Shelley. Uh, other people who grew up there was uh, Leonard Bernstein, uh, Sheldon Adelman, and Summer Redstone, who uh, ran CBS uh, in his latter years. John F. Kennedy did not grow up in Boston. He actually grew up nine-tenths of a mile from where I'm sitting right now in Bronxville, New York. There is Leonard Bernstein. Uh, Shelley was telling me all the mothers would um, congregate at his house uh, because his father was a wheeler dealer in Boston politics. And um, Leonard Bernstein's mother was one of uh, those who played at the Saltman household. Saltman household. And all the other women would uh, shake their heads and look at Mrs. Bernstein and say, well, what is he doing? Look at him. He's good looking. He's smart. He's personable. Why is he playing with this music? He's never going to amount to anything. The women were wrong. Oh, and there's me and Bobby Orr, who played with the Boston Bruins uh, in their Stanley Cup years, 1970 and 72. Uh, me and him, 1978. Uh, there's lots of sports in Boston. There's the Sox and the Pats and the Bees and the Celtics and Fenway Park and the Patriots and Celtics and Bruins and the old Garden. 
Uh, the Braves and the Indians and Redskins are long gone from the Boston area. The Braves left in uh, 1953. The Indians Redskins left after 1936. There was the curse of the Bambino because uh, Harry Frise, uh, who owned the Boston Red Sox, sold them off to the New York Yankees. Some of that money ended up uh, with uh, the production no no in the net, the Boston Marathon. And Bill Russell, uh, there's his statue, even though he didn't like Boston, but he was a great player in Boston. And the big cigar, Red Arback from Brooklyn. Uh, he um, uh, was uh, there, uh, and, and he was uh, the coach of all those great Boston teams. And the Boston Marathon, 1967. Catherine Switzer grew up as the daughter of a major in the United States Army, so failure was never really an option uh, for her. Uh, while studying at Boston University, one of her coaches told her that a fragile woman couldn't run the Boston Marathon, so she uh, trained in secret, entered the race as Kay Switzer. That's her boyfriend, Big Tom Miller. Uh, and he looks like he's knocking over this old guy there. And he is. That's Jock Semple. And Jock was the organizer of the Boston Marathon, and he hated the idea of a woman running in the Boston Marathon. And he tried to push her from behind, face first into the uh, concrete, which could have caused a lot of damage to her face, uh, to her nose, broken jaw, broken nose, broken teeth, whatever. But uh, Big Tom Miller was a football player with uh, Syracuse University. He's also a track and field guy, a national uh, shot put. Uh, he was uh, ranked nationally in shot put. Uh, so um, he does end up uh, pushing Semple to the ground. He was worried about uh, he was going to be charged with assault. And Switzer finished the race, first woman ever to finish the Boston Marathon in four hours and 20 minutes. It's my friend Ted Fay. He tried to save the 2024 Boston Olympics. Uh, the United States Olympic Committee had uh, designated Boston as its choice city for the 2024 uh, Olympics. Um, this uh, picture was about 20 years ago now. Uh, in 2015, the Boston Olympics bid was extremely unpopular with local residents who thought they'd be on the hook for paying for the debt of the games and so were no real benefit to the Boston area or Massachusetts for that matter. Ted, who lives in Amherst, said, let's expand it out of Boston and came up with another plan, which was ultimately rejected. Uh, the original plan uh, called for virtually all of the Olympic activities to be held in Boston, uh, the area, but all of Massachusetts residents would have had to pay for the games in some fashion. The Boston committee had two rollouts of the bid. Both failed to generate any enthusiasm and Boston dropped the bid. Uh, that's central Boston again, the Quincy market and there's the state house back there. Oh, the Declaration of Independence. See, every year in that building on the 4th of July, somebody pops out and reads the Declaration of Independence. Um, in Boston, during the bicentennial, during the bicentennial, there was a guest, excuse me, there was a guest in town. The Queen, the Queen of it. Excuse me, the Queen of England, Elizabeth II, she spent July 4th, 1976, in Boston, celebrating the Declaration of Independence 200th anniversary. President Gerald Ford and Queen Elizabeth II, a few days later, toasted one another in Boston. And with that, whether you're on a boat like I was or a plane, it's time to leave Boston. In my case, my next stop would have been Portland, Maine, which was once part of Massachusetts. A couple things about um, uh, the, the uh, American Revolution. Um, Boston was the, the, the cradle, so to speak. All the thinkers came out of Boston. Uh, but Virginia had uh, their share as well. Uh, Boston would give up, uh, rather Massachusetts would give up the Maine colony as part of the 1820 compromise with Missouri because uh, Congress wanted to make sure that there would be one free state and one slave state coming in, not to upset the balance in, in Congress. And um, um, after the war, um, the uh, British got their supporters out of what was the United States, and they plopped them in a couple places. One was Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia was cut in half and became New Brunswick. 
and the Canadians who are or actually the Brits were playing around with uh, a uh, capital uh, in uh, north of the United States. Uh, one of the towns they looked at was Kingston, K-I-N-G-S-T-O-N, and it was near the near Watertown, right across the border. And um, they figured, no, that wouldn't do because the Americans probably would attack us. Uh, then they thought about Montreal, too many French, Quebec City, way, way too French. If you go to New Brunswick, Benedict Arnold is a hero in New Brunswick, even though he's run out of town because he and his son had too many shifty deals that were going on there. And uh, well, uh, he went back to England. Uh, they chose Ottawa uh, because there were 40 miles of swamp between St. Lawrence River and that bluff in Canada. And they figured the Americans would never invade risking malaria. So, uh, but it all, not all, but a lot of it started in Boston. And a lot of it started in Boston because what they heard in Nova Scotia. Nova Scotia could have been the 14th colony. Um, Washington decided um, could have, they just would have gone from Massachusetts right across the river and Nova Scotia was there for taking. But Washington didn't have money, decided, nah, you know, it's not worth the, uh, the cost of the ammunition. And there was a lot of skullduggery going on uh, in Nova Scotia um, between the Americans and the Brits. And the Brits used Halifax as their major port. And, well, Nova Scotia stayed. It would be about uh, 55, 60 years later that there would be rebellions in Nova Scotia because they were looking down south. And they said, they can, Boston, they got rid of the Americans, uh, rather the English. Why can't we do it? And eventually they did. Anyway, thank you so much. Any questions, any comments? The floor is all yours. Everybody for Zooming in tonight. And uh, we hope everybody has a great uh, weekend and week ahead. And uh, we'll see everybody on the next lecture. Thank okay. you. Okay, we'll talk to you soon. Hopefully we could do another one at some point. Sure, sure. That comedians one sounds pretty good. Yeah, we're I'm working on it. Uh, it's it's Jewish comedians, and we got to break it down to stand up. Yeah, we're we're breaking it down because there was a formula. It's vaudeville, burlesque, radio shows, and uh, and the Rodney story, of course, and and Rickles and Jer where do you put Jerry Lewis? He's part of a team, uh, but he he becomes a director and invents stuff, and then you got the women, Gene Carroll and. Uh, uh, Tody Fields from Boston, oh, and actually she isn't, she's from Connecticut, but she went to the comedy clubs in Boston. Always was on the Dean Martin roast. <laughs> yeah. On the and, 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 and you got Joan Rivers and Elaine Boozler and Sarah Silverman. And uh, so we're trying to cut it. My friend Max, who wrote jokes for Rodney Dangerfield um, and drove Rodney around. Um, like I said, he's, he's, he's in, he was in Estenada, uh, Mexico yesterday. So he's coming back this weekend. So we're going to try to work it down to, because he, there's just too much, way too much, but we're, we'll, we'll work it down. We'll get it to where it's 50 minutes. And I start with Freddie Roman because I knew Freddie Roman who once told me not everybody could be a stand up comic as, and he pointed out soupy sales and he said, Soupy was a great improv guy, great sketch guy, but a lousy stand-up comic. And he knew it. All in the timing. Yep, yep. So, okay. So thank you all for being here tonight and thanks the library. And uh, we, will, uh, we will talk to you soon, I guess. Have a great evening. Take care. Bye-bye.